Good morning. Uh, I'm Jean Morrison. I'm Boston University Provost uh, and, and Chief Academic Officer. And it's my real pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to the 2023 Arrows Lecture at Boston University. Since its creation in 2014, Arrows, or Advance, Recruit, Retain, and Organize Women in STEM, has thrived to bring visibility to and develop solutions for the obstacles facing women in the sciences and engineering. The Arrows program has had a clear impact on BU from university-wide events and programs that bring newfound visibility to this important issue, to our successful piloting of the Sea Change Award program through the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which supports institutional diversity and inclusion in STEM. We see the impact in ways that Arrows engages with people and sparks discussion across our campuses through its ongoing lunch and learns beyond bystanders and women in STEM mentoring circles program and the Hidden Her Stories project, which are all helping to build community and ensure safe, respectful environments in which everyone can work and study. Indeed, across the STEM fields at BU, women are taking research and service to a new level of excellence, producing important new knowledge and practical discoveries that positively impact our quality of life. At the same time, we cannot escape the fact that we lose talented young women at every stage of the science and engineering pipeline, and that considerable work remains to, to be done to ensure as that, that women are well represented in these critical fields as students and as faculty and as rising professionals. The most challenging problems facing our society cannot be addressed without bringing all available talent from a variety of backgrounds and reflecting the diversity of our nation into our classrooms, departments, and laboratories. BU's continued excellence in research and discovery depends upon our success in creating an environment where both women and men can thrive and where diversity of perspective is valued and nurtured. And this is what Arrows is all about and why the programs and initiatives that they run from professional development workshops and skills building exercises to seminars, panels, forums, and funding opportunities are so critically important. It's why events like this morning's lecture are such a key building block in the ongoing effort. In just a moment, I'll have uh, Joyce Wong, the director of the Arrows program, uh, introduce Dr. Shoykit. Before she does, I wanna thank you for being present and engaged in this important conversation. I'm grateful for the involvement and advocacy of so many members of our community, from the undergraduate WISE at Warren, the Society for Women Engineers, and UWISE students, to the graduate and postdoc GWISE group and gender minorities in mathematics and statistics to the BU's women, BU Women's Guild. Your commitment to building infrastructure and support and resources that encourage the continued advancement of women at all levels is critically important. And so with that, I wanna thank you again, welcome you to the Arrows Lecture, and I will turn it over to Joyce to do the introduction. Joyce? Thank you, Provost Morrison, for the introduction. And actually, it's great to be in person. Again, it's just so fantastic. Um, and and I, it's really wonderful to see in the audience, um, undergraduates, graduates, staff, um, faculty, and leadership here. So I'm really thrilled um, that you're here um, for this event. And I'm really thrilled to introduce you all to our 2023 lecture, our ERAs lecture, Professor Molly Shoykit. She is the Michael E. Charles Professor in Chemical Engineering at the University of Toronto, where she also holds the distinguished title of University Professor. Beyond her many innovations as a scientist and engineer, 
Professor Schoikert is a successful entrepreneur and regularly engages in science outreach with the government and general public. But today I think has a welcome home feel for, for Professor Schoikert because she holds strong connections with New England and the Boston area. She earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry just across the river at MIT and then earned her PhD in polymer science and engineering from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. After three years down in Providence, she spent work, working at Cytotherapeutics Incorporated and as an adjunct faculty at Brown University, Professor Schoikert returned to her native Canada in 1995 to establish her lab at the University of Toronto. Since then, she has published an impressive over 650 pat papers, patents, and abstracts, has given over 420 lectures worldwide, and has graduated 220 researchers. And Professor Schoikert's research aims to advance the basic science and enabling technologies of tissue engineering and drug delivery. She is a, a world leader in the areas of polymer synthesis, biomaterials design, and drug delivery in the nervous system, and in 3D, three-dimensional hydrogel culture systems to model cancer. Professor Schoikert's research accomplishments and unique breadth of work have resulted in her being the only person to ever be inducted into all three of Canada's national academies, the Ca Canadian Academy of Sciences of the Royal Society of Canada, the Canadian Academy of Engineering, and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. But beyond academic research, Professor Schoikert has co-founded four startup companies. How, Molly, how do you find the time? <laughs> Spinning off work from her lab, including um, Amecathera, which in 2021 secured 10.3 million in private funding to begin human safety trials on an injectable gel that can improve post-surgery pain treatment. Professor Schoikert's considerable scientific outreach, meanwhile, has included launching Research to Reality, a national social media need initiative that shines a spotlight on Canadian research. And, and this is important now more than ever, I think, in, in terms of science communication. And she's also served as the first chief scientist for the province of Ontario in 2018. Professor Schoikert has earned a host of important honors and awards for her work. Just a few of them. She has been inducted as an officer of the Order of Canada. She's been awarded the Order of Ontario, named the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Laureate for North America. She's been elected a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering and has been awarded the Margulies National Brain Disorders Prize. So without further ado, it is my distinct honor to welcome to the podium one of Canada's most celebrated scientists, our 2023 Arrows Lecturer, Professor Molly Schoikert. Well, thank you so much for that brilliant introduction. I'm almost afraid to give you my lecture now, but um, it's wonderful to be here. And um, thank you, Joyce, for giving me the opportunity to be here and uh, Provost Morrison for your lovely introduction about the importance of women in STEM. And we talked, we were talking earlier how, you know, I thought my mother's generation were the trailblazers. And in fact, they were, but I thought those trails would have already been blazed. Um, but I find myself blazing my own trails and some of you are nodding because you're blazing your own trails too. And I think, that um, you know, the next generation is gonna have to continue um, to blaze those trails. Anyways, so um, because this is the Arrows Lecture, um, I wanted to tell you about our science, but I also wanted to tell you a little bit about my journey. And um, another title that I could have called this is uh, staying in and stepping out. And so what does that mean? To me, that means staying in the game, staying engaged, whether it's in academia or industry, stay in the game. Um, I think sometimes we take ourselves out of the game for various reasons, but if there's ways that we can stay in the game, and I think especially in the US and Canada, there are support systems for us to stay in the game and, and still have a life, um, it's really important. Um, and the other, the stepping out is stepping out of your comfort zone. I think um, all of us, um, women and men, want to stay in our comfort zone. But when you stretch yourself, um, uh, you know, you 
you get exposed to to new ideas and uh, you know life is just I think so much more enriching. So if there's nothing else you remember, if it's um, <laughs> staying in the game and stepping out of your comfort zone, um, then that's my take home message. So um, Joyce actually introduced me um, quite thoroughly already, so I won't spend much time on this slide, but I I wanted to highlight. Um, three different groups of, of people who've been really important um, to my career and, and just to my life. And I started with sort of my academic journey. And, and you know, I highlight Alf Malin, who was my chemistry high school teacher, because he was just so inspiring that I went to study chemistry in university. And actually, some of you might know my brother, Brian Schoikid. He also went to study chemistry in university, and it was because of, of this guy. And then Ed Merrill um, at MIT, he taught me a polymer course. Um, so he was I didn't do a thesis with him, but I remember calling him partway through my PhD going, you know, you have one of those moments like, am I really in the right place? And should I, do I really want to be doing this? And, you know, he um, was very lovely and open and, you know, gave me that confidence just to, to continue on. And then Tom McCarthy was my um, PhD supervisor and Tom was very open-minded. I was really, I almost actually went to med school here at BU. I deferred admissions and then just stayed per, to pursue a PhD, but was really interested in, in biology. And Tom could care less about biology, but he was open-minded enough to go, you know, whatever you, you just go do. And um, so I was able to, you know, do some, some things and um, which, which were interesting to me. And I think, you know, I, I try to have that to a certain amount, you know, with my own students to let them explore, make their own mistakes um, and, you know, guide them, but give them that opportunity to be independent and creative. And then when I worked at Cytotherapeutics, Frank Gentile and Shelly, when I couldn't find a picture of Shelly, but they were both just great mentors to me as I went into Cytotherapeutics was driven by cell biology. Um, and there I was as a polymer chemist, and um, it was just a wonderful um, learning experience. And then I just wanted to highlight um, Michael Sefton. I'm not sure if you can see him so well here, and Mitch Winnick. They both um, were mentors from day one when I got to the University of Toronto, and um, I continue to send them, you know, grants or papers or just go to them for advice. And and so. I'm one of those people that likes to reach out and get advice from lots of people. I think I do it because I'm waiting for someone to say what I want to hear. But um, <laughs> so not that Michael, if anybody knows Michael Sefton, you know, he won't necessarily say what you want to hear. But not that either of these two individuals will say what I want to hear, but they've been um, really wonderful and supportive. And then I'm, I'm showing you this picture just because I think it's a great picture. It's when I was the chief scientist of Ontario. Um, and uh, and this is when I won the L'Oreal UNESCO because I think it's you can't see it's such a crappy picture, but my mom and I are actually standing beside it. So mentors have been incredibly important to me, and my family has also been incredibly important to me. Um, my mom and dad, um, we like to celebrate in our family. So when I got promoted to full professor, we had a party. You can see it's kind of in a room like this, like lovely chandelier. <laughs> <laughs> I had to point that out for you. Um, <laughs> this is my husband, Kevin. These are my kids, um, uh, Sebastian and Emerson, when they were cute and little, and this is them. They're like 20 something now. And um, my I know, I do know their ages. Um, this is uh, my brother, Richard, um, and my brother, Brian. And um, now I have to include a picture of my dog, Draco. Um, it's just because, you know, your kids go off to university and you replace them with a dog. <laughs> but um, the other thing is just to highlight the importance of, um, you know, the researchers in the lab who do all the amazing work and then all of our collaborators. So everybody listed here are, are people that we have the privilege to collaborate with. And then these are, um, this is the lab and, you know, just, I, I love what I do every day because I have the opportunity to work with just brilliant people who, again, force me to step out of my comfort zone and, and teach me new things. And, um, and of course, grateful 
funding. So, so these are all the people, um, you know, family, mentors, researchers, collaborators, um, okay. that enable us to, and, and me, I guess, to do so many different things that, that Joyce said. And, and I always think that, you know, life is a team sport that, you know, whether it's having somebody to help you, you know, pick your kid up from daycare or, or take them to a soccer practice or whatever. Um, we can't do all the things we want to do, or we have the ambitions to do alone. And so it's, it's really important to have a great support system. And, and I'm lucky to have one. So I'll just acknowledge that I am going to talk about some of our translational work. And so I am a co-founder of Amica Thera and Senecas, and we've invented a lot of patents. Um, we don't know if they all have commercial value, but hopefully. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, and I'm just going to talk about this. So um, I'm really inspired by this idea of changing the world and how can we change the world with our research? And um, sometimes we can translate that and turn it in, you know, to spin off companies. So I'll tell you a little bit about those stories as well. And then communication. I, I actually, these images we're all up at the airport, Toronto Pearson Airport for a couple of years, like before the pandemic, when people were going through airports. Um, and they were up on the walls with um, like a dozen others. So somehow we convinced the, um, the airport um, in Toronto, which has 48 million people going through it every year to put science on their walls. Um, other airports just have it, but, but we didn't. So we were pretty excited about that. And then um, when I think about things that I like to um, encourage people to do is, uh, I've already talked about staying in the game, but this idea of embracing your inner geek. I remember when my, my sons were young, I said, if anybody calls you a geek, you say thank you. Because, you know, like I think it's the, the geeks in us that change the world. You know, you have to do something different. You have to be a little different if you want to do something new. Um, and then... This, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone, make yourself uncomfortable. And then I think we all have to advocate for ourselves because, you know, it's sort of like if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to. So let me tell you just a couple of these stories. I'm not going to go into gory details in terms of the science, but of course, I'm going to highlight it. So a lot of what we do starts off with the what if question. And I think that's what's so wonderful about our jobs is we can just wonder. You know, and so I'm going to tell you about a couple of these what if questions. Um, and the first one I'll tell you about is this simple question of what if we could guide cells in 3D, in three dimensions? And it's much more common now, but you know, about 20 years ago when we asked this question, not too many people were thinking about growing cells in 3D. And so it was really what could we discover? What could what tools could we make? And now we think about, well couldn't we actually make a difference in cancer? And then I'll tell you the story about um, what if we could circumvent the blood-brain barrier um, and what could, we, what could we discover in stroke, spinal cord injury, or blindness? And I'll, I'll just tell you a couple of those stories. So the first one relates to growing cells in 2D. So most of what we know about cells is what we know about growing them on hard plasma surfaces. And in our lab, um, you know, it's 25 years ago, soon after I got there, um, Samar Saninjad also was growing cells on 2D, and we were trying to guide nerve cell growth. And the way we guided nerve cell growth is we had these alternating patterns of adhesive and non-adhesive. So you can see the cells are growing on, these are actually gold patterned, um, and peptides are modified on them. So the cells are adhering here. And then we had actually had polyethylene glycol, so the cells aren't growing here. So we could guide cells in 2D, we could grow cells in 2D, but um, so that's not that exciting. Um, but when you think about us, we're 3D and um, we don't have hard plastic um, in us. And so wanted to think about, could we guide cells in 3D just like we are guiding it in 2D? And could we do it on soft materials like hydrogels? Because other than bone, most of our tissues are soft and squishy. And so, um, so the answer is yes. Um, so Ying Lo, when she first came into the lab, we gave her this challenge. 
And she took agarose, which itself is non-adhesive, and she chemically patterned in adhesive volumes. And she was able to grow, uh, these are nerve cells, um, into, you can see the, the pattern is fluorescent green and the cells are colored red, and you can see the cells growing in the green pattern. And then Yuki Azaiwa, when she joined the lab, wondered, if I immobilize a growth factor onto these hydrogels, can I differentiate stem cells to a specific um, cell type? Um, because usually we add these growth factors as a soluble form. And in fact, she was able to differentiate these are neural stem cells to oligodendrocytes. And then when Ryan Wiley joined the lab, we wondered, you know, this, I always call this 3D. It's not really 3D because we were only controlling the Z direction. And so Ryan Wiley said, can I do something where I control the X, Y, and Z direction? And so he used multi-photon uh, labile groups and multi-photon patterning to uh, immobilize two growth factors simultaneously in 3D. And so we spent a long time developing a bunch of different tools to show that we could guide cells in 3D, um, we could create concentration gradients uh, and guide their growth. And this then, um, with a series of different, I'd say, innovations in 3D hydrogel chemistry, set us up to do something completely different, which was to take these fundamental tools and see if we could use them um, to answer questions in cancer. And it really all came about, we were doing some work in cancer, but it was more in drug delivery. And the hydrogel work was really kind of developing this tool and answering these very fundamental questions. Um, and then Sean Owen, um, who's now a professor at the University of Utah, he came to my lab as a postdoc with a background in cancer and said, you know, Molly, I wonder if we could use these cool hydrogels that you've developed to do something interesting in cancer. And so, you know, I went on that journey with Sean and the whole lab then pivoted um, to working in, not the whole lab, half of the lab, because <laughs> we still do regenerative medicine, half the lab pivoted to work in cancer. Um, and these are all the people that have worked um, in the, this area over the past several years. Um, and so um, I'll just tell you a little bit about that story. And so, you know, you have to really be careful to go into 3D because everything is more complicated. It's much easier to look at cells in 2D, like all of the microscopy, not all, most of them. It's so much easier to look and interrogate cells when they're uh, in 2D. Once you go to 3D, you have to do confocal. It takes a lot longer. Um, the instruments are more expensive. Um, and so if you're going to go into 3D, you need to have a really good reason. And then, of course, to make the 3D environment uh, also takes a lot longer. So what we realized was um, we actually got into this journey also by uh, one of my uh, collaborators, Bill Stanford. And he said, Molly, you know those really cool hyaluronin-based hydrogels that you've developed? I wonder if we could use them to study a rare lung disease uh, that affects women because it's a highly invasive disease. And so again, I went on this journey with Bill and what we realized that you could do in 3D that you cannot do in 2D is you can study invasion. So if you're trying to um, study invasion um, in 2D, you can't do it. You can study migration, but not invasion. And so what 3D does is, and, and in this rare lung disease, it's kind of like cancer. And so you're trying to kill the cells but you're also trying to stop their invasion. And so you can model that in 3D, um, but you can't do that in 2D. Of course, you can do the cytotoxicity assays. And so this has led us into now not only working in this rare lung disease, but also looking at glioblastoma, which is a highly invasive cancer, um, lung cancer, we're doing some work. Anyways, lots of different cancers. Um, I'm gonna show you this image just because it's such a beautiful image. Roger Tam was a research associate in the lab, and uh, he did all this beautiful work of designing or of synthesize, designing and synthesizing these hydrogels. And so the first two rows are just the top view, and the third row is the reconstructed view. And what you can see from the third row, and these are, um, hopefully you can see these are three different primary lung cancer cells 
These are two different lung cancer cell lines, and these are healthy cells. So what was really cool about the healthy cells is that they did not invade at all. And that was a good outcome for us because we want to model the disease cells and not the healthy cells. And in the disease cells, you can see they're all invading, but they're all invading to different extents and by different mechanisms. We never went on to study that, but I think it would be super cool to, to understand um, those different invasive behaviors. What we did go on to do, and this is um, Bill Stanford, who I mentioned previously, um, was use these to then screen drugs in this rare lung disease which is called, I'll say it once, lymph angioliomyomatosis or LAM. And there will not be a quiz on that afterwards. It's okay. Um, but what we did together is we screened 80 drugs and Bill has gone on to screen 800 drugs um, to see if we can find targets to, because um, there's only rapamycin that's a, or lung transplants that av that's available uh, to women with this disease. And um, rapamycin just slows the progression, uh, which is great, but it's really insufficient. And so um, rapamycin acts via an mTOR pathway. And you can see mTOR, this is a pretty high hit. So green is good, red is bad, um, but it's not the highest hit. And some of the mTOR signaling is way down here. So this is just by going to 3D we've discovered drugs that we never would have discovered before. And now we're trying to see if those drugs that we're discovering or those targets that we're discovering will make an impact. You know, we're starting with the animal models of disease, um, but it's a super exciting journey to be on. So, so that's the, the first story I wanted to tell you about in cancer. And now maybe I'll tell you a little bit about my what if story around um, the central nervous system. So what you might know about the central nervous system is that the, um, has everybody heard of the blood brain barrier? The, yeah, so the blood vessels in the brain, uh, the endothelial cells make these tight junctions. And so if you take um, anything orally or intravenously, uh, it will have a harder time getting into the brain unless it can somehow permeate across the blood brain barrier. And most things don't which is really fantastic most of the time because um, most of the time we want to protect our brain, right, from toxins. But um, it's problematic when you want to deliver molecules to the brain. So um, how are we going to get across that blood-brain barrier? Well, some people will open it up with focused ultrasound, um, and that works quite well. We thought, well, instead of trying to like break through that barrier, so like imagine a road, you're traveling down a road and there's a barrier, you can either try and crash through it or maybe pull the barrier apart. Or if it's a country road, maybe you can just go around it, you know? And so that's what we, that's, that was our approach. Our goal is to get drugs or therapeutics to the brain, to the spinal cord. So why don't we deliver drugs directly there? Let's not try to take advantage of the vascular system to get there. So I'm going to show you um, a movie um, about some of our spinal cord injury research. Um, it's about two and a half minutes long. We didn't test this one, but hopefully it works. Um, there's no sound at the beginning. Spinal cord injury is devastating. It can result in permanent damage to the spinal cord's ability to send and receive messages. At the cellular level, there is massive disruption to axonal networks. Many neuronal and glial cells die and an aggregate scar is formed. Apart from standard rehabilitation, there are no treatment options. The Scheuchit Lab is developing an interdisciplinary approach comprised of stem cell transplantation, biomaterials, and scar-degrading enzymes to promote spinal cord injury repair. To replace the cells lost due to injury, we have identified a population of stem cell-derived neurons 
that form long processes in the spinal cord after transplantation. However, ensuring cell survival and integration into the existing neural circuitry remain significant challenges. To promote the survival and integration of transplanted cells, we have engineered a hydrogel using a physical blend of hyaluron and methylcellulose that is easily injectable, enables biomolecule delivery, and is bioresorbable. Once injected, the hydrogel cross-links to form a minimally swelling gel. Extracellular matrix-derived peptides can be conjugated to the hydrogel to promote cell adhesion, thereby further improving cell retention and survival. However, another challenge remains. These newly transplanted cells need to integrate with existing neural circuitry. At the Scheuchert lab, have been looking to scar degrading enzymes to modify the cellular microenvironment and enhance the integration of the newly transplanted cells. Chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans are potent inhibitory components of the aggregate scar. They prevent axonal regeneration, synapse formation, and plasticity. Importantly, these can be degraded. To enhance integration, we at the Scheuchert lab have engineered a more stable and active form of chondroitinase ABC and developed a strategy for targeted delivery. While these interventions are still being tested in preclinical models, there is hope that one day these strategies of stem cells, biomaterials, and scar degrading enzymes will provide the foundation for spinal cord injury treatment. So, so that movie was um, made by Alessia uh, Zyka, and she, her name should be here. There it is. Um, she did, um, she's part of this biomedical communications program at the University of Toronto, which is um, actually, is actually the program that got me excited about um, uh, about using movies as a way to engage the public in in science. Anyways, I'm just going to tell you a build on um, one of those one of the three aspects that was highlighted in that movie, and that is this injectable hydrogel. So this is the only chemistry I think I've got in the presentation, but it's comprised of hyaluronin and methyl cellulose. It's actually just showing you the chemical compounds. Um, HA hyaluronin has everybody heard of that? It's like in everything. We were joking, like stem cells seem to be in everything too. Um, so hyaluronin is um, an ultra shear thinning um, material and uh, methylcellulose is inverse thermal gelling, which just means as you heat it up, it forms a gel. And um, it's got some really cool engineering properties. So I'll just show you this, this little movie. Um, the uh, There's no sound with this one, but... Um, we colored it blue just so you could see it. So it's basically a gel in the needle. And then we apply a little pressure and it flows. But as soon as it comes out of the needle, it forms a gel again, and it's just this blue blob. And um, so what's important here is not the size of the blue blob, but the size of the needle. And um, I, I love this movie because I like to tell all of you, my American friends, how smart we are in Canada because we don't have the penny anymore because it costs so much more to make the penny than the penny's worth. And of course you, my American friends will say, well, that's just because it's a Canadian penny. But anyways, <laughs> so, um, but the point of that is not the penny, um, but um, we can put these through like 30 or 32 or even 34 gauge needles. Like we've injected cells into the back of a mouse eye Think of this a mouse eye, um, and um, with a, with this gel. So it's the shear thinning properties are really cool, and the fact that it gels right away was really important to us, especially in the injured spinal cord, where we're injecting it into that fluid filled cavity, the cerebral spinal fluid, um, where there's flow. And so, if it wouldn't gel immediately, it would get distributed throughout the entire cavity. 
Anyways, we've gone on to, um, with a series, I guess, a family of inventions, we started Amicathera, and I started Amicathera with Mike Cook. So he um, started off as a postdoc and then a research associate, and then um, together we spun out this company, Amicathera. And um, I don't know, there seems to be a lot of pictures with me and needles, and so that's why that one's there. But um, the first product is focused on post-surgical pain. And so what that means is you go in for surgery and you're in pain afterwards. And there's usually um, about two or three days where the pain is most intense. And it's during that time where um, you get prescribed opioids. And so, you know, we're quite excited um, to be in clinical trials, to be showing that drugs that are already prescribed to people non-opioids, um, reformulating them to have them last longer um, so that people don't have to take opioids could really make a difference. Um, you know, there's the, the market pull, but there's also the societal pull. So um, still early stages. Um, as anybody knows who's been in biotech or worked with biotech, it's it's a long, it's a very, very long journey. But um, so this is our platform technology, um, the Amica gel. Um, we, we got human safety data um, last year. Um, we're a big challenge for small companies is making GMP material. Um, and so we got over that hurdle um, recently. And so now we're, um, we have our product manufactured and we're hoping to continue to do uh, and planning to do um, the, the clinical trials, the phase one, two, and three. And at the same time, the company is thinking about diversifying into pipeline products, um, building on some of the fundamental technologies and, and, in, um, and uh, inventing some new ones. So that's a little bit about the Amicathera story. They've got their own labs. They've got their own funding. They've got their own CEO. Um, I'm not involved in the day-to-day, -day, but I get to be involved still in the science and the oversight and the strategy. Um, I'll tell you one last story, and this is um, kind of a what-if story, but a little bit more targeted of a what-if story. And so it all happened um, about half a dozen years ago, maybe a little bit longer, Rob Deveni, who's a vitreal retinal surgeon, um, said, came to me and said, Molly, you need to come up with a new vitreous substitute. And, um, and he said, you know, the reason is, he said, you got all these hydrogels. Do you think you can make me a new vitreous substitute? And he said, because the, what we have currently for patients is, is really suboptimal. So if somebody has a detached retina, so you know the retina is at the back of your eye, if it becomes detached, which is very common actually, just unfortunately as we age, um, if you get a detached retina, you have to actually reattach it to the back of the eye, otherwise you'll go blind. So there's ways to do that. You can, um, what's most common is to get gas injected into your, um, like they'll take out the vitreous and then they'll just inject gas. And so what, what happens is they sort of laser the retina to the back of the eye, and then they have to keep it there while it's healing. Um, and so they use gas, they'll use a heavy gas, but um, in order, like we all know gas floats up, right? In an aqueous solution. So then you have to like lie on your face for um, several days so that it keeps pushing up on the back of your eye. And so that's pretty crappy actually. And then um, you can't see for three weeks, you can't travel by air um, and uh, you could develop glaucoma. So the other strategy that we currently have for patients is um, a liquid. So inject a heavy liquid like a silicon oil or a, a perfluorocarbon, but you still have blurred vision for um, several weeks. This can result in inflammation. It will emulsify over time if everybody's made salad dressing, so oil and water. Um, and so you'll have to have it removed. And so we um, invented a new hydrogel. And I'll tell you, the first couple tries didn't work. But um, more recently, um, it is working. And so we call it Syngel. And uh, the, the thought is that you'll be able to see right away. You won't have to lie on your face for several days. 
and you'll have, um, you know, so you'll have clear vision and you should not have to have a revision surgery, surgery because it will be bioresorbed and um, you should be able to travel. So that's the promise. We don't know if that's going to happen yet. Um, Alexander Baker was a PhD student and then did a short postdoc in the lab. And he um, designed this hydrogel and demonstrated. So like, what do you need if you're going to inject something in the eye? Obviously, it has to be transparent because you want to see. And so it is. So that was good. Um, we wanted the, we looked at a series of different formulations um, and they are all stable in vitro um, and mostly non-swelling. Like one of the big problems is there's one other company actually doing this and they're injecting a gel that degrades very quickly. And if any, has anybody worked with hydrogels? Like when you work with hydrogels, they typically swell when they degrade, right? So um, it's a confined space, your eye. So if the material swells, it's going to increase the pressure in your eye and that's going to cause glaucoma. So the fact that this isn't swelling too much is really good. Um, in terms of refractive, this is the native vitreous. Um, we've matched the, um, the refractive index. So it's going to be bending light similar ways. And we've matched the density. And I'm just comparing it to silicon oil because that's already used clinically. It's actually amazing to think of some of the things that are used clinically. Like who would have thought silicon oil would be injected into your eye? But um, the problem with silicon oil also, it has a really low surface tension. And so it can get behind that and, and re-detach re the retina um, because it has a low surface tension, but this one has a higher surface tension. The, the, it's a hyaluron and oxygen hydrogel that we synthesized. Um, and so I'll just show you, um, one last science movie. Um, you can tell I like movies um, or we like movies. So this is, um, okay, so this is going in a rabbit eye. So um, if you're not interested in seeing that. Oh. Sorry. I know it looks like I'm completely uncoordinated. There we go. Okay. So, um, you know, like, um, epoxy, two-part epoxy. This is not a two-part epoxy, but we mix two components of our hydrogel together uh, because it's chemical gelation. And again, we colored this one blue too, so you could see it because obviously normally it's transparent. And I don't know if you guys can see this based on the light, but we're filling this eye. This is a rabbit eye and it's, maybe you can see it now, it looks blue. Yeah, so this is, um, and then you'll see a little bit of it coming out of the side. Um, and then this is just another eye, so I won't make you watch that again. Um, so, um, so we're really excited about the vitreous substitute. And um, in uh, rabbits, we've now shown that it's safe and efficacious. We're now working on scale up and manufacturing and, and also thinking about what else could we do with this. And so what else we could do with the hydrogel is it could be a vehicle to deliver other factors. And so if anybody's heard of wet age-related macular degeneration or wet AMD, um, so wet AMD, we have um, antibody therapeutics for anti-VEGF. Um, that's about 10% of the AMD population. The other 90% are called dry AMD, and we have nothing for them. So we've been thinking about delivering, we've developed some pretty cool new strategies to deliver factors and using that hydrogel. Um, as a vehicle for delivery. Oh my gosh, I am never on time. This is so exciting. So, because um, I looked at the schedule and I think I'm right on time. So, so what have we done by asking these what if questions? We've invented new materials. We've started to model uh, cancer in vitro to discover new drugs. Um, I didn't tell you about our, our novel strategies for protein therapeutic delivery. Um, we've I, I showed you that movie around local delivery to the spinal cord, but we're looking at that for the brain and the eye for retinal disease and, and stroke. Um, and we started a couple spin-off companies. So because I think I still have a couple minutes, um, I'm going to just show you one last movie. To, I don't know, maybe you'll be like, maybe too many movies. But um, 
so this last movie is has nothing to do with my research, but Joyce mentioned I started this national social media initiative called Research to Re Reality with the number two, and um, really was um, inspired by all the great science we have in our backyard, but also like Boston, you guys are in your own ecosystem because there's so many universities and there's so many um, brilliant people, but most cities don't have that density. And so, um, I mean, I love the city of Toronto, but I often felt that people didn't realize all the great research that was there. And then I would say, you know, probably across the United States and across Canada, really across the, the world. So initially when we started Research to Reality, we thought, ah, this is an international um, issue. But then we thought, let's start at home. Let's start where we can make a difference. And so I teamed up with Mike McMillan, who's um, um, uh, he's a producer of feature films, but also loves, just loves science. And so um, together, so this is a movie that um, I was involved with, but he was the one who um, filmed and produced it. it. It's one minute. And so we had this, when we first launched in 2015, we had this a movie on um, on the Discovery or um, Science Discovery Channel um, and on TV. Let's see if this will start. It's deeply human to explore how things work, to understand why things happen. In the 21st century, quantum physics sits at the core of how we communicate and approach unanswerable questions. Canadian university researchers are using light to store and manipulate information. Brilliant minds in the field are working with the Canadian Space Agency to create new ways of sending quantum information around the world to secure online transactions and ensure information safety. They're using quantum computers to solve math problems that were too large for traditional computers. It's a new technology that promises to revolutionize the way we live today and tomorrow. Canadian researchers are out there exploring. Come meet them. So we we have like six of these like one minute movies that I just adore um, at researchtoreality.com. But we also have about 300 videos where we've gone in and interviewed mostly professors, but um, also um, graduate students uh, or postdocs and, you know, really had them tell us what they're doing and why it's important. And, you know, trying to connect that those dots for society, for the public in terms of um, how research is has shaped our present and how it will shape our future, but it's very much forward looking in terms of that's the that's the idea of research to reality and sometimes the reality is, you know, today tomorrow, and sometimes the reality like with the quantum physics stuff is you know still probably twenty years away. Um, so lastly, um, you know, I started with like. What I'm really passionate about is seeing how I can use what I do in science and research, translation, communication to change the world. And, uh, you know, the gauntlet that I throw out to you is, is how will you change the world? And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. So that was great, Molly. So because we are recording this, actually, so we're going to ask if, if anyone has a question to uh, Molly, we'll repeat the question, um, but we'll open it up for questions now. Thank you. That was so inspiring. And you're, I don't know how you've done this. So I have a question for you as like a mother. How did you do this? Like, how did you have time to do this? I would love to hear about like, I don't know any advice. <laughs> okay, so I think my message, my main message is I didn't do any. Okay, oh, oh, so sorry. <sighs> really, I forgot like immediately. <laughs> so the question is just how do you do what you do as a mom, right? And um, well, first of all, I have a great partner and um, <laughs> I have my top 10 list. We were joking about it. Um, but the number one is um, to marry well. And <laughs> it's like, what? I was like, too late, just joking. Too late. <laughs> Shouldn't have repeated that part. 
but you know the so but it's I say that you know because we joke you know like for women you know like a long time ago might like you know go to university to get an MRS type of thing right which um I don't know that I'm sure that was true for some women but obviously not for professional women and so um but just having a partner um who supports and not just supports, but values what you do. So I think that's really important. And then, um, you know, my mom used to pick the kids up from school. Not everybody lives close to home, but, um, you know, having maybe carpooling with somebody. So you're not doing it all by yourself. Um, you know, as uh, this is, I know this is being recorded, but as much as um, my husband does is amazing and supports and values. I did take the kids to almost all of their doctors and dentist appointments, but, um, but, you know, like I was my son's soccer coach. I mean, only until he was six because then he was too good, but, you know, from for three years, I was like, you know, if you're taking him to the soccer field, you might as well be the coach, you know, cause at that age you can do it or, um, but it was just always, um, really just not doing anything alone. So with kids, just having other people in my network to help support, take care of them. Um, so do you, I guess so one follow-up, do you, did you feel that your like career kind of maybe at a certain age of the kids, like you were able to really like launch yourself or do you feel that you've just like always been able to be continually so productive? Well, um, the, the questions like, I think life, the question was like, are you continually productive? Um, and, um, you know, I'll say that I don't think I read any book other than children's books, which actually I adore children's books, um, until the kids were around 10 or 12, you know, and then um, I started, a. I felt, okay, you know, they're old enough, I can like start to read again. And then um, I started a book club with some some of my women friends, just because I thought, okay, I want to have a life again, you know, so there was, but, but also like one of the things, um, like, even though I have two boys, as you know, one swam competitively and one played soccer competitively, we also skied together. And that was something we could do together, you know, so when they're skiing, we were skiing. So it wasn't always like trying to find, I guess, activities doesn't have to be sports, where you can do something while they're doing something as well. You know, I dropped my son off at soccer practice because after he was six, you know, I wasn't his coach anymore. And then I could go for a run, you know, so try to, I just was, you know, I think we all try to multitask, but that was how I would, how I did it. But, but for sure. I mean, yeah, every, like life just gets, yeah. Sure. So I'm just curious, you know, what your thought process is for when you were spinning out this company. At what point did you feel you had enough body of research to support our company on you know, eye disease or whatever? Okay, so the question is, is when do you know you have enough to spin out a company? Um, it's a great question. I'm not sure that I have an answer. So Seneca is actually the eye company. There, it's it's kind of a virtual company. I mean, we've incorporated and we've got the name. But we're really, we haven't raised external funding. It's all supported by grants still. And so it's still very much a research project, but that's our ambition. Um, and so that's what we're driving towards versus just writing the papers. Um, and so there's the patents and, and um, so, so that one we haven't spun out yet because I don't, I don't, you know, when we've talked, you kind of know when you talk to, um, people who might give you money, like, because <laughs> they'll be, they'll say, you know, like, do you risk this more for me before um, I'm going to give you any money? And so, and with Amicathera, um, you know, Mike is, uh, Cook is extremely resilient because he knocked on so many doors and had so many doors closed on him until one opened. And then as soon as one opened, another opened. And then, um, and then another one open, and, and so like, and there's still so much. I mean, again, in Boston for biotech, this is like the mecca, and um, I don't know. All of us, in, I think, around the world are salivating at what goes on in Boston. But um, 
you know, there's more competition, but there's also, there's more money and there's more experience. And so it, I think it's a, it's, if there's anything that you're passionate about, then it's, it's really fun, but it's an enormous amount of work. It's, and I'm not doing 95% of it, you know, I'm just contributing a small amount. And even that, I think for um, faculty, um, you know, I did start my first company um, pre-tenure. I had my first son pre-tenure. I remember um, a male faculty before I got to the University of Toronto said to me, and not from the University of Toronto, said, okay, Molly, whatever you do, don't have kids before tenure. And I looked at him and I said, why did you not have kids before tenure? And he goes, oh, no, 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 of course I had kids. <laughs> um, so then damn it, I was going to have kids before tenure. But um, but the same thing, I don't know how I got off on that track, but oh, like starting a company, like um, that first company I started, I exited um, pretty early, mostly because it, it became clear to me that um, the co-founder and I wanted to take the company in different directions. And I was, I was happy. And you said like ebb and flow, like I exited that company. I had just had a, um, my first son and I was like, you know what, I'm going to walk away from this one. So, um, you know, whether that was a good financial decision or not, I don't know, but anyways, thanks. I see a lot of students out. Irving. I actually have a technical question. Oh, awesome. You showed, you showed the, you, the image of the gel being injected into the rabbit's eye. Yes. Filling up. Was there a set, second port for the air to exit? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so we didn't see another needle in You didn't? Oh, I disagree. Oh, sorry. Oh, gosh, Joyce. <laughs> really, what's wrong with me? Loud the, the question was, um, when we did the injection into the rabbit eye, uh, was there a second port? And in fact, what you saw was the exit port because you saw the gel coming out at the very end. And what you didn't see was the in port where we were filling up the rabbit eye. But yeah, thanks. So I, I have a question, Molly. So with, with oh, yeah, well, all right. Okay. So what with your images at the airport? I'm just wondering what kind of feedback have you gotten from that, and also from you know research to reality. I'm curious if you can share that. Uh, sure. So um, I don't know about you guys, but I think if I knew how hard all the things are that I like go on these journeys to do. If I knew how hard they were, I would never have started. So like research to reality, what happened initially is we made these beautiful videos, right? I was working with a feature film producer. I mean, you saw that video, that's amazing. But even all of our interview videos, so we had all this great content and then we were like, shit, someone's gotta see it, you know? And so then it's a whole social media initiative. Like it's not just having the beautiful videos, you've got to basically, market them so people will come and see them and then you realize wait a second now we're competing with all the commercial advertisers right for coke and pepsi and whatever where they've got giant budgets to make these like advertisements and what are like we're not selling anything right so we're just selling ideas or we're like trying to bring people into this world so they'll learn more um and, and then you're also competing with like everybody's, now we have TikTok, so it's much more pervasive. Um, we didn't have TikTok in 2015 and, and everybody's cat video, you know? So it was very, it, it's been and still is really hard to engage people um, in, the, in the videos. So, um, you know, so we hired people who know way more about social media than I do, which is great so that we would, and then we also supplemented the videos with blog posts and, and stuff like that. So um, I'm not, I can't remember what your question was, but like, oh, so what's the response? So we do have like a really nice following, but it's never as big as I think it should be, right? And then with the, the science art at the walls at Pearson, it was super fun because um, well, but you only hear about from it from people who know you or know somebody or see some, you know, because um, so that was always very positive. Um, but I don't know, you know, I think most people just walk by it. And that's fine. But if you know, just 
0.1% of 48 million people stopped and looked at it, then, then that reached its goal. But it's hard to, like we, don't, like we have the online metrics for research to reality, but we don't have it for people walking through the airport. So, you know, and it was only one part, so I, I don't know. Yes. Uh, Molly, thank you so much again, uh, great talk. Um, just maybe a little technical, but kind of peering into the future, right? Um, in terms of biomaterials for regenerative medicine or for small molecule biologic delivery, right? Like, what are you interested in? Like, what what boundaries, I guess, of the has the field not yet overcome? Um, what applications are there that are still maybe low hanging fruit, or ones that seem like low hanging fruit but maybe aren't? So, kind of interested here. Okay, so the question was basically like, what do I see in the future uh, for opportunities for biomaterials? Is that right? And, and maybe therapeutic delivery. So, um, so it's really obvious, but um, one of the fundamental limitations of protein delivery is the inherent instability of the proteins themselves. And so we, and I think so many others in our field have come up with ways to control the release of the therapeutics, but we know, like we all know, they're not bioactive for that period of time. So I don't have an answer to this, but I'm very excited um, to start thinking about that and seeing how we can make our protein therapeutics more stable. So we actually did that with you know, the movie. It talked about an enzyme, chondroitinase ABC, that degrades the aggregate scar. Um, we worked with Actually, who was I talking to? Oh, we were talking about my brother, Brian Schoiket. So Brian's a computational um, chemist or biochemist, and he had a postdoc in his lab, Matt O'Meara. And Matt was really interested in working with us to see if we could make that enzyme more stable. Because it's a very potent enzyme. It needs to be delivered locally, but it degrades so quickly. It's so fragile. And so, um, you know, we developed all these beautiful ways to deliver it for a long period of time, um, but we knew it wasn't gonna be very active for very long. And so um, he used, so Matt used um, PROS and Rosetta, two programs to computationally model the protein and figure out, could we make, he looked at 37, 55 and 92 mutations where he predicted the um, enzyme would be more stable. And then uh, Marion Hederachi in my lab and, um, worked actually with Teresa O'Meara, Matt's wife, and they expressed fusion proteins of this chondroitinase ABC. Um, anyways, all that to say is we have, so we made it more stable um, and more active, um, which is super exciting. Um, so those are some ways that I think there's opportunities for biomaterials to take advantage of all these cool delivery strategies that we have. Um, but really make a difference in therapeutic delivery. So that's that's one way. Yeah, thank you. So, so thank you so much, Molly. But before we um, conclude the lecture, we, um, on behalf of the BU community, we wanna give you a small um, token of our appreciation. It's hard to do it with. <laughs> You, your name oh. and your. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've known Joyce for so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we conclude here, I just want to um, make a couple remarks. First of all, I want to thank Christian Morales for the amazing work. Um, the Arrows administrator for so thank you, Christian for. <laughs> And I also want to thank all of you for your, your strong support of, of women in STEM and, and for, for all that you do. And I think there's also like a GYs event later this afternoon and a Wise Guys first event next week, which is amazing. Um, but uh, I just uh, will, will say again, thank you for all of you for, for your support as always. And then uh, please join us in the reception for, for continuing this really, really important conversation. But thank you very much. <laughs>